Ever wonder why some folks can't stop arguing about which music is the best, or why your grandma can't understand your favorite artist? These are examples of biases in music culture. By exploring how music is a part of people's lives, we can get a sneak peek into how these biases are wired into us in the first place. In this video, we're going to take a look at examples of bias between music listeners and how we can recognize it in ourselves and others. Intro to biases. Before we can get into specific parts of music culture, let's make sure we have an agreed understanding on biases. Mazarin Banaji, a bias researcher, defines bias as simply any deviation from neutrality. Biases are a mental template that help us to quickly make sense of things as we go about our lives and face challenges. Now, it's helpful to have biases in many situations, but they can be prohibitive to learning and experiencing new and fascinating things. Simply put, if you have a brain, you have bias. And when we look at bias and music, it can come in many different forms. Survivorship bias refers to when someone focuses on things from the past that have survived or succeeded to tell their story. Confirmation bias refers to the tendency to seek out and interpret information that supports one's existing beliefs. So music bias examples. That isn't real music. I was born in the wrong generation. Today's music doesn't have any soul. Hip hop isn't music. People who like this type of music are, then some other general ones, why people can't seem to ever enjoy new genres or artists, especially when you try to show them something, or why people always say their older stuff is better. You might see some of these biases in physical forms as well, such as this t-shirt or this bumper sticker or even this advertisement. To learn more about bias in a simple and visual way, check out this animated webpage that was created by the Smithsonian Institute. It's really, really cool and interactive. So new and old music, young versus old listeners. So quick disclaimer, this is not to feed into a generational war between young and old, but it's rather to explore the origins of bias in music culture as it can be a significant cultural divider and we can't always understand why. So we're gonna try to do that here a bit. So music evolves from generation to generation because of stylistic trends and the tech that's used to create it. Just like anything else that benefits from technological or artistic evolution, such as movies or even cars. So studies show that music is linked with the memories of defining moments in our lives. Even in patients with Alzheimer's, they're still able to often remember key memories associated with certain songs when they were asked about them. Not just moments, but places as well. People get exposed to a lot of music when they're younger, uh, but after a certain point though, it's found that at about age 30, people stop finding new music and tastes can solidify even earlier in the early 20s. This is for a variety of reasons. Busier lives, decreased neuroplasticity, and the fact that we already have so much music that makes us happy, so we keep reaching for those things instead of searching through the haystack to try to find new tunes. Listeners are inextricably linked to the music of their generation as it contributes to their identity. We're products of our time and our current culture, and we naturally consider something we are familiar with to be good. This may explain why individuals might believe older music is better, as it harkens back to the nostalgia of finding that music or the good times that came along with it. There's an incredible online data quiz by The Pudding, and it identifies generational gaps in music by asking participants to identify songs from different time periods. The data reveals that only certain songs are able to maintain a culturally pervasive stature as time goes on, as individuals are more likely to recognize music from their generation. Some songs, such as Phil Collins' In the Air Tonight, drop off in recognizability by almost 50% from one generation to the next, which is crazy to me. I thought that scene from The Hangover would have fixed that. But you really need to go try this quiz. It's so cool because you can start to see how certain songs are a touchstone of a generation, but they only stayed popular with that group, while other songs, they've been able to maintain their pervasive status between generations. After taking the quiz, I hope you would realize and agree that it's a faulty generalization to label music as simply good or bad based on its release date. This example really proves the survivorship bias for me because it shows that there's songs from every generation that stay in the test of time, and there's others that don't. Therefore, I feel like it's a false statement to say music was better then when the only proof that we have is the cream of the crop from a given period. On the topic of music exposure, you might start to wonder how regularly listeners from different generations are being exposed to music. 
There's one study that finds that millennials are listening to 75% more music than baby boomers on a regular basis. There's even evidence to suggest that millennials have a substantial ability to recognize music from the 1960s to the 90s, as well as the music that they consume throughout the day. For Gen Z, there's a report that reveals that they listen to between five different genres regularly, and that age range, about 13 to 24, listens to 40 minutes more music daily when compared to the rest of the population. And this is because of the recent prominence of music and social media, where this generation is obviously hanging out the most. Now this rise of music listening is obviously because of the formats that these different generations are listening to music on. So the past gave listeners vinyl records and cassette tapes, and these days we have digital downloads and streaming. For these reasons, we can't simply compare the experiences between young and old in a vacuum. Different generations experience music differently because of formats that prioritize certain things. For instance, there used to be a limitation on albums because you had to try to fit 22 minutes on each side, up to 45 minutes for a whole album, and there was a strategy for crafting albums towards that limitation. Then the same thing happened in the CD era, where artists were regularly making albums that were 70 minutes or longer in order to fill CD space. Now there's no limitation like that in streaming. Streaming is incredibly cheaper and more convenient and accessible than physical music, and it's more personalized than the radio. It allows for listeners to be exposed to more music on a singular platform, and this concept may be a reason for the difference in music experiences between, say, baby boomers and millennials. In the past, people probably only heard about music on the radio, or from friends, or by shopping in stores, but now you can find absolutely anything in mere seconds, so this must have an effect on the listening experience and how people enjoy music. So these things remind me of the mere exposure effect. Being familiar with something really changes your perception of it. In one study on the mere exposure effect, researchers played a bunch of random music examples to a variety of subjects, and they concluded that familiarity is the single most important variable for explaining differences in liking among music. So in the study, if someone had heard something like a certain genre before, they were instantly way more likely to enjoy it. When we become familiar with a certain type of music, our brains create a set of expectations for hearing that type of music. And when you're introduced to something new, you may subvert that expectation and it can be really jarring for many people. It's like your brain is suddenly receiving all sorts of new info that it doesn't know how to make sense of or sort correctly. So the question I have here is, if listeners from older generations were inundated with as much music as younger generations are today, would that remove some of the biases people have about hearing new music? Or would some of those listeners still be biased against hearing new music because of another bias called anchoring or first impression bias? So a common bias statement on this topic is they don't make music like they used to or variations of that statement, which that statement is so dependent on what you want out of the music that you listen to, right? Each generation has its own things that it cares about when it comes to good music. For some, that's a guitar riff. For some, it's a heavy hitting 808. And for some, it's a nursery rhyme that's been replaced with swear words. And I think sometimes people hear a new song that has an unfamiliar sound and they think, oh, this sounds nothing like the music I listened to growing up. And they'll use that as the basis for not liking something. But that's the anchoring bias working on you right there. There's true artistry in music from every era. It's just the package that it gets put into. I'm sure you can imagine how some popular musicians would have adapted differently if they were placed into a different era. If Bob Dylan were to come to prominence, say, 35 years later than he did, he might have changed his sound to use auto-tune instead of the electric guitar. If Snoop Dogg was dropped into the jazz era, he might have become a scat singer. Artists are influenced by their generation of pop culture and trends and the things that their labels want them to do. It doesn't all happen in a vacuum. Let's go back to the topic of mere exposure for a second. I wanted to add on to what the YouTuber Mike the Snare had to say about the use of the word mid referring to today's music. They have a great video on their channel about how prominent this term is today, especially in the online space. And I think it comes down to the perceived disposability of music today with streaming. I think we come across so much content every single day that if we put some music on and we don't instantly connect with it, it's so much easier to just call it mid and move on. When we have everything at our fingertips, there's really no reason to hang on to something that isn't stimulating us and we can always just click off and go to the next thing. But have you ever been in a situation where you couldn't do that? Have you ever been in a car that only had a CD player, for instance? No aux, no Bluetooth. 
that was my first car. And as annoying as it was to lug around a bunch of CDs all the time, I'll say that whatever albums I had, I was forced to really listen to them more and absorb them better. When the songs would come up on replay, it was kind of like watching a movie for the second time. You just, you notice so much more the second time. You get to that next level of detail, you start listening to the instruments a little more, you start listening to, for the lyrical themes. So much changes when you have more exposure to something. The purpose of music in people's lives. For us to recognize biases when it comes to music, I think it's really important to recognize that there's no simple one definition of good music. There's no platonic ideal of music because that means something different for everybody. Our upbringing, our culture, the things that we're exposed to, they all contribute to our understanding of music. And as we grow up and have more choices, some people will stay in those lanes and go farther down them, as listening to a certain type of music may be traditional and comforting, as we know a lot about that one genre versus all the others that are out there. It feels like you're seen. Then there are some people who get their joy in experiencing what else is out there and what draws other people towards it. And let's not forget that everyone wants their own thing from the music that they listen to. Some people want to dance to it, some people use it to chill. It's a reflection of your socialization behaviors and studies have shown this. There's strong correlations between the genres that you listen to and the amount of socializing you do. If you're more extroverted versus introverted, more agreeable or not agreeable. So what would your favorite genres say about the type of person that you are? Are you empathetic or open to new things? Are you routined or you go with the flow? What happens when we attack music? If you think of your musical preferences as a house of cards that you've built up in your identity over the years, throughout important parts of your life, you know, the happy and the sad ones, when somebody disagrees with your taste, it kind of blows that whole house of cards down and it gives you some intense mental strife. Why? Not only because it angers you, but it's also possible that it gives you a primal sense of fear and insecurity. I would say it's not too hard to see why people take things that way because if you've built up your taste and your love for something over years of your life throughout all the hard moments in your life, you have that soundtrack to listen to and somebody attacks that, that's part of you and that's part of your memories and that is deeply embedded in your brain. The music that you love is an experience that your brain craves and creates dopamine for. People are incredibly tied to the music that they listen to. So when people attack an entire genre of music, it often means that they're attacking an entire culture of people. Not all music serves the same purpose. We often try to pit styles of music against each other on the same scorecard. And this assumes that different styles are trying to achieve the same goal but different genres and styles all accomplish different goals. Some music is built upon melodic complexity, and some is just to sound cool. Some is just trying to be background music. These different sounds, they're born out of real life, social circumstances, what instruments people have at the time, and the stories that people feel that they need to tell. Some of these can be complex and epic, and sometimes they're simple. That does not make one better than the other. Nostalgia and bias. It can be viewed as pessimist for someone to always recount towards the past. Happy, rose-tinted memories are often paired with a discontentment for right now. In this article from the 90s, criticisms of nostalgia are discussed as the latest opiate of the people. They call it a collective escape from the complexities of the present in times of trouble and change in an idealized vision of the past. Regarding music and nostalgia, in the book, When Genres Collide by Matt Brennan, he brings up the point that writing music history is an act of production, of choosing what to leave in the story and what to leave out, of viewing the details through a lens that filters out inconvenient details to project a coherent narrative. I think it's easy to discredit people who are nostalgic because it's often paired with a sense of longing for the past when things were better. You know, people view it as regressive, but it can be a good thing and here's some reasons why. Here's a study that interviewed people who have something called vicarious nostalgia, where they have an affinity towards an era that they never lived through. In it, the subjects reveal a longing for a time that seems so perfect, so beautiful and so vibrant. It served as a basis for social belonging with groups and clubs. There are studies that indicate nostalgia helps promote a sense of well-being and psychological safety to those in their later years of life. It simply helps to validate people's life stories, even if they do omit some details in that recollection. Nostalgia can help people to feel young again, which is a really important point. So, you know, feeling young means feeling strong and having more intense experiences, being more socially connected, having things ahead of you. When people are nostalgic and it transports them 
outside of whatever mundane situation you might be feeling at this moment, that can be a really good thing, if, especially people who are near to the end of their lives. I don't want to discredit those good things about nostalgia. There's very many good things that nostalgia brings, but I'm hesitant to rely on that as a source of happiness because it likely means that there's some sort of discontentment for the present, and I'm only able to look back for safety. Me, in my age of trying to be adventurous and try new things, only going back and listening to the music I already know just feels like going in a circle of, this makes me happy, I've been here before, this is security, and I don't want to be in that frame of mind because I love finding new things. I just, I know there's so much good art out there that I haven't heard yet. I never want to become a person who says they did it better back in my day because that would likely reveal that I'm either not looking hard enough or that people just don't create things in the particular way that I'm used to and have an affinity for. In my current age and my situation, I know how much artistic endeavor and energy is out there. It's breathtaking. It's so much that I can't absorb it all, but that's just me right now. I can't predict how I'm going to be in 30 years, though try as I might. We need to see through the bias. Overcoming bias regarding the validity of music, it takes considerable work from any individual, whether you're online or you're in real life talking to people about music. Participants in a study listened to two pieces of music, one from a student of piano and one from a world-renowned professional. The researchers found that when a participant preferred the latter piece, their brain activity suggested that they listened to the music much more closely than the student's performance. This poses the question, what makes a piece of music good? Is it technical skill that allows for its validity, or is music more than skill-based characteristics? The answer is likely different for any musical listener, but technical elitism is prominent throughout music culture. One can make the argument, I certainly would, that musical authenticity is perceived in different ways for every listener, as it's a subjective art form rather than a March Madness bracket. There's a writer, Abhi Lasha Mandal, that states that elitists have often defined authenticity in a way that hampers the existence of creative diversity. And I really like that quote because, you know, these attitudes, they perpetuate an apples versus oranges debate regarding musical legitimacy and they often find their way into any form of online music content or discussions that we may have. So I think it's possible to have personal preferences without disrespecting others, but some people, they simply just enjoy denouncing others as a way to shame those with different musical preferences. It's easy to conflate personal preference and just prejudice when it, we're discussing different genres of music. And this is especially true if the person you're discussing with believes all the various types of music out there should serve one ideal purpose, such as displaying technical ability through an insane guitar solo. But that's not how it should be viewed. So let's talk about some ways we can overcome bias. Here's two anecdotes that have helped me to overcome my bias and understand the importance of variety. So first, spaghetti sauce. This story comes from Malcolm Gladwell's 2007 TED Talk, and it's one of my favorites. This is a story about Howard Moskowitz, a psychophysicist and a market researcher who revolutionized the food industry with spaghetti sauce. Moskowitz's groundbreaking studies in the early 1980s concluded that there just wasn't a perfect spaghetti sauce, but rather a variety of sauces that cater to different tastes. His data showed that people's preferences could range from plain to spicy, and remarkably, one third of them favored a extra chunky spaghetti type, which was a type that just wasn't available in the supermarkets at the time. Upon sharing his findings, Prego, the client of Moskowitz, seized the opportunity and created a line of extra chunky sauces, which quickly dominated the market and earned them $600 million over the next decade. This marked the beginning of a revolution in variety in the food industry, as companies realized the power of catering to diverse tastes rather than striving for a single perfect product. That is the final and I think most beautiful lesson of Howard Moskowitz, that in embracing the diversity of human beings, we will find a sure way to true happiness. Overall, his work empowered companies to rely on variability and try to cater to different tastes instead of just trying to create one really good product. This is really important because people have different tastes depending on their backgrounds. Go watch the talk for the full story, but it's really powerful because it shows us that we're better off as humans by celebrating variability instead of one universal truth. And I think that applies to music really well. 
Now this other anecdote I have really put into words my feelings about the process of trying new things and getting to like them. I recently listened to a really good podcast with Rick Rubin. He discussed being exposed to new music and how the first few times you may be baffled by it, but then with a bit more exposure, a bit more understanding, and a bit more context, it can become something that you just can't live without. This conversation revolves around the experience of encountering unfamiliar music, and while it might seem like a waste of time at first, sometimes if you give something a bit more time, you'll actually fall in love with it. Rick Rubin recalls a time when he was introduced to a go-go band called Trouble Funk on a hip-hop cassette. Initially, he hated it because it didn't align with his interest in hip-hop at the time, and it wasted seven minutes of runtime on the cassette that he was given. However, after listening to it over and over again, he eventually stopped listening to the rest of the cassette, and he fell in love with that song on the tape. This experience taught him to try persisting with something that he initially didn't like, rather than just dismissing it right away. He then also goes on to talk about his approach toward recommendations. He says that if three different people suggest the same thing to him, even if it's something that Rick Rubin would normally hate, he'll give it a try. He used the example of horror movies, how he hates horror movies, but if three people suggested a horror movie to him, there must be something good about it, and he feels that it's the universe wanting him to be aware of something. He then goes on to give an important way to think about criticizing something. He emphasizes that criticism should be subjective, expressing it as, I think it's bad right now, rather than an absolute, like, it's bad. He believes that this way of thinking can lead to a deeper understanding and appreciation of art that you don't know because it recognizes that there's always a possibility that your preference for something can change over time. So where to go from here? So why did I make this project? Honestly, it's because I have a visceral reaction to the phrase, that isn't real music. To me, that statement is representative of so many layers of I don't want to use this term, but the term really is like bigotry, just the general refusal to experience new things. My personal bias is that I'm the son of a DJ and naturally I was exposed to a lot of different music growing up and uh, that, that's my bias. I love different types of music. I've always felt conflicted as to what scene I'm a part of. I never felt like I could be one thing, partly because I was... I always felt that I was trying to please everyone in my immediate surroundings and partly because I just really enjoyed a lot of different genres and circles. I've always considered myself a floater in this way. While that way of living has its downsides, it has led me to learn a lot about different genres, participate in different scenes, and see a huge variety of musicians live. We are products of our time and our upbringing, and it's important to recognize and celebrate the things that are different between us. Is that realistic? I don't know. We always seem to find our way back into the dogfights with people online or in person. But I'll say that I'm happy to be a witness to the vast spectrum that is the music culture out there. I wouldn't want to be part of one where I like and know everything. There should be differences between people because that is the spice of life. Mamma mia, that's a spicy meatball. We should try to understand different types of music before disliking it. Spend time with it. If you listen to a certain genre enough, you'll likely begin to understand what makes it worth its while. Music is a journey for everyone, and we all start from different places. Let's try to give each other a wave on the way by. I have so much more to say on this topic. I cut out an entire section about music makers and analog versus digital and guitar culture and all that, but I'm going to leave it here for now. Let me know in the comments down below if you have any other thoughts on this topic, as I'd really love to hear some different viewpoints on bias in music. That's all I have for so far. Thank you very much. I'm Dan, and I'll see you in the next video.